Welcome everybody to Sports Nutrition 101 uh, Supplements and my name is Andre Noel Potvin. I'm president and founder of InfoFit Educators and we have an amazing lecture tonight that I know you will walk away with a fortune of great information. Our lecturer is Dr. Seema Canwal. First off, um, I've known uh, Dr. Canwal since uh, about 2006 out of a clinic called Interchanges that I operated with a, another naturopathic physician. And um, we've done lots of presentations together and worked together over the years. And I have to tell you that I am just amazed at the wealth of information that this woman um, comes, comes with. And I think you're gonna have an amazing uh, lecture tonight. So. Just to tell you a little bit about Dr. C. McCannwell's journey is uh, through naturopathic medicine, was motivated by her enthusiasm for learning and a keen interest in the human body. She obtained her Bachelor of Science from Simon Fraser University and then joined the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Forensics Laboratory in Ottawa, Ontario, once she graduated. She was drawn to naturopathic medicine after experiencing its benefits firsthand and began her training at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto. Dr. Canwell has been practicing uh, nat naturopathic medicine in Vancouver since 2006. She is one of few naturopathic physicians who actually hold a pharmaceutical prescription right in B British Columbia, and one of the only naturopathic physicians in all of Canada to be trained in the APOE diet. Presently, Dr. Canwell is working through the Fellowship of Anti-Aging Medicine through the internationally renowned American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, A4M. Welcome, Dr. Canwell. Thank you, Andre, for such a sweet introduction. <laughs> Okay, just to uh, let you know, Seema, we have quite a few people on the line, and uh, I'll just tell you, if we've got Nicol, uh, Nicole Lars Laxon from Vancouver, Gabriel from Vancouver, Anthony from Surrey, and Chris from Moncton, New, Brans New Brunswick, and a few, few others. Okay, well, let's uh, just welcome everybody, and Seema, um, how are you doing this evening? We're, I'm doing great. I can't believe someone's here from Moncton. That means they're about 1030 right now. I'm amazed. Mm. Whoever you are, thank you for attending. <laughs> so late. Well, I don't want to um, hold uh, everybody back much longer. So Seema, take it away. Well, welcome everybody and thank you, Andre, for that introduction. Today we're going to learn about sports uh, supplements. And so I'm going to go through a bunch of different areas, but you have questions, please absolutely put them in the question box and I will uh, try to answer them at the very end. We're going to go through and learn a little bit about the, the key nutrients that is important not only for exercise, but also potentially different phases of life. So whether you are a trainer or, you know, this is just for yourself or, you know, a friend's family, whatever the case is, hoping that, you know, this will hopefully shed some light and a little bit more clarity on you know what is good information and not so good information and how to even look for information that's actually correct because unfortunately the supplement industry is one of those industries that there is a ton and ton of misinformation and lots of proper information as well so just sifting through all that data can be pretty challenging to say the least so one of the first things i'm going to get started with is good old pregnancy so if somebody is pregnant or you have a a uh, you know client who is pregnant one thing very important to understand is you know what is their nutrient guideline uh, uh, you know requirements during pregnancy and we all know that during pregnancy the nutrient guidelines that we have currently is not nearly enough especially when it comes down to somebody's diet sometimes we do need a little bit of extra added uh, nutrients so if somebody is pregnant you want to ensure that they're having some form of a prenatal vitamin which usually tends to have a little bit more iron in it, a little bit more folic acid. Now, folic acid is a very interesting one because folic acid often is considered as something that is just for pregnancy. It's actually not. If you are an avid athlete of any sort, one of the important things to understand is what is folic acid's responsibility? So folic acid and B12, they go, they work in pairs essentially. So how folic acid is actually used in the body is many, many different areas, but namely it's for the brain and 
nerve function. That's probably the number one thing. So sometimes when you see people or even yourself, if you're doing a lot of heavy exercise during a certain period of time in your life, or if you know that digestion is off or what have you, one of the things you want to look at is your own lab values for where is my iron, where is my B12, and where is my folic acid. Because folic acid, although we think that yes, it's just to prevent neural tube defects in a pregnant mom, there's actually a whole host of other 200 other functions that it's responsible for. So what I've put on your on the slide is really only six. But when we look down to the nitty gritty of where folic acid is required in our metabolic processes in the body, there are multi multitude of them. Now, uh, like nowadays, we asked a lot of questions about fats. There are people doing keto diet, there's people doing paleo diet, there's people doing you know, low fat and high fat. It is all over the map. So we, I will get into this a little bit further, but this is just a kind of like a cheat sheet on what are some of the, the better fats to have versus some of the stuff that you do want to stay away from. So this is where it becomes important is to actually read your nutritional label. The labels themselves will often tell you what type of fat is in there. So ideally, if it is in a package, the chances are it may not be the best bet for you. However, if something is not packaged like nature intended, that might be something to look at more preferentially. But again, I'll go into this in, in a little bit here. Now, protein is something as well that, you know, there is so much information about, like, what, do we need this much protein? Do we need that much protein? If you look at the ketogenic and the paleo type of diets, it's very, very uh, heavy on the animal protein. And whereas some people may actually benefit from it, unfortunately, I've seen kidney function completely plummet with the amount of protein that sometimes people are actually consuming you're going to use protein, you want to ensure that your kidney function itself is actually able to handle the amount that you think you should be having. Hopefully that all makes sense. Now, when it comes to um, just even generally speaking, this is not just for pregnant women, this is for, you know, I think just in the general population, the one thing you wanna be mindful is deli meat. Deli meat the nutritional value in actually store-bought deli meat is practically slim to none. And the reason for that is if you look at deli meat, how it can actually sit in those, uh, in those glass containers for an extended period of time is because of all of the preservatives that's added into it. So when we're looking at nutrients and supplementing and what have you, if you all your, if something, if you know, like something like deli meats is a part of your daily regimen, taking a multivitamin or, you know, taking a B-complex, is it actually going to benefit you? I, I would question that because what it really boils down to initially is, okay, what am I actually putting into my body? If I'm going to be taking this multivitamin, if I'm going to be taking this B-complex or this vitamin C, is my body actually going to absorb it? If I have the habit of having, you know, deli meat sandwiches or deli meat for dinner or breakfast or whatever, whatever the case is, is a processed meat that have quite a bit of preservatives in them like the sulfites, like the nitrites, how much is that actually going to hinder my absorption of nutrients or is that going to actually help my absorption of nutrients? That's something that I would ask you to question and just gather for yourself, what am I actually doing? Now, mint tea, funnily enough, is something that uh, pregnant women should not actually be consuming at all because that actually will block milk flow. So this is a completely random information that I thought I'd throw in there for fun, but uh, <laughs> that's something just to keep in mind. Uh, now, something with regards to after a woman stops cycling, and this also includes for men, I should have said andropause and menopause. However, when it comes down to you know the, the, the next phase of life, so whether that be late 40s or 50s or 60s, whatever the case is, 40% of the body consists of muscles that are used for movement, for work, and for play. And when your muscles are strong, you can confidently lift, you can reach, you can move, you can push, you can pull, and you don't even think about it. Strong muscles will reduce the possibility of injuries. And what ends up happening is you end up improving body composition. And that alone, I've seen people do such a major transition in just their sense of confidence. And not only does this shift your confidence, it also allows your body to recover more quickly from any type of physical activity that you're choosing to do. 
Sarcopenia is a reduction in muscle strength and size, and that typically will occur as the result of aging. And this is actually shown past the age of 30. So once we reach the age of 30, we want to preserve as much as our muscle mass as absolutely possible. Muscle loss can result from a variety of different factors. So that includes, you know, is this person having enough dietary protein intake? Are you having, you know, are you reduced in the muscular activity? Oftentimes when we see, you know, people get into the workforce or what have you, or at a, as a, at a actual desk job, the amount of physical activity that's actually done tends to be a lot less. And that's where it's really critical to ensure that we don't have that physical inactivity. Otherwise that injury or illness, we can actually take a lot longer to recover from. Middle-aged women and older women need to consume adequate amounts of protein in order to maintain their muscle mass. Now, weight training programs for women are very, very effective in preserving muscle mass and preventing sarcopenia. But the biggest thing really is the support and the benefit on the bones themselves. One of uh, the, um, one of the, I was reading an article not that long ago and one of the advice from one of the ex experts said, you're probably too old not to exercise. In other words, exercise is just not even an option, right? So I'm sure we're all in that same, we're all in that same uh, thinking along those lines. Now, when it comes to health benefits, I'm sure I don't have to go through this with anybody, but like I was saying earlier, that most adults will lose anywhere between five and seven pounds of muscle every decade. Now, after I was saying after women reach the age of 30, there's a decrease in muscle density and increase in intramuscular fat. And that's what's been found in the thighs, which is, I'm sure we all know, this is one of the major areas for women is their, is their thighs, especially if they've had any children. This trend continues as lean body mass decreases by about 15% between the ages of 30 and 80. So in general, there's almost a 30% decrease in overall strength by the time women are anywhere between the age of 50 and 70. And then there's a dramatic loss after the age of 70. Now this is all stats, but that doesn't mean you have to be a stat. I don't know if anybody watched the Oscars over the last weekend, if anybody saw Sigourney Weimer, that woman is 70 years old that she does not look like she has aged a bit in the last, what, 20 years ago that we saw Aliens or whatever that movie was. So the point of this is essentially that when you are lifting, you know you're protecting yourself over the many golden years that lie ahead of you. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be less functional and I don't want to have the ability and a higher percentage of body fat later on with a declining metabolic rate. So that's why I think this is important to touch on because you know there are certain things that yes, can happen as we age, but do we want it to happen? Maybe not. Are there things you can do to prevent it? Absolutely, and that's the good news is that following a well-planned resistance training program will not only increase the muscle fiber in older women, but also increases the actual ability to be able to combat that sarcopenia that normally occurs in women, but does not have to. That's the best part. Now, every decade, as we were saying, as we lose muscle mass, the metabolism also decreases. The slower the metabolic rate, that contributes to that, that weight gain. So it's, it's not necessarily about the amount of calories that we're going to be consuming or the calories that we're burning. It's kind of old news here, right? So I'm going to go a little bit about, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, the, in a little bit as well. But each day, really, you're, you want to look at 35 calories to maintain about each pound of muscle. Now, Having said that though, when you're doing some type of resistance training, that's going to most likely ensure that your risk of osteoporosis is not going to be there, the bone density is going to be a lot stronger, but that means that nutrient intake will also shift. So, you know, trying not to eat sugars and, and what have you that are simple carbohydrates in those later on in the years, whether it be menopause for women or andropause for men, makes a really, really big difference. Uh, when it comes to bone health and strength. So we, I'm going to touch a little bit on the calor, uh, you know, just basic calorie intake. So when it comes to aging or what have you, one of the first things you want to look at is really decreasing caloric intake. You know, the one thing that's very popular now is intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting is something that's actually been around 
for decades and decades. It's, this is just now that in the media is something that you know we're looking at. Now, intermittent fasting is something that's interesting because it works for some and not for others. You really have to look at your own nutrient intake. You have to look at your own metabolic needs. If you're somebody on thyroid medication, for instance, intermittent fasting can possibly make the thyroid worse. So this is not something that's for everybody. And this is just a general 16 hours. You fast at eight hours, you feed. But those eight hours actually really matter when those eight hours are. Some people really benefit from eating from 12 to 8. Some people benefit from eating from 11 to 7. And some people 10 to 6. You really got to figure out what is right for you. Now, for some people, it, they're better off to eat in the morning. So eating breakfast and eating lunch, but possibly not for dinner. So when it comes to intermittent fasting, you know, the, there's a, if you look, at, look this up online, there are tons and tons of people talking about this all the time now. But if you look at different cultures, fasting has been a general part of culturally for different, different cultures throughout history. So this is nothing new, but the, the, the basic benefit is if, let's say, you're borderline type 2 diabetic or if you are you know, having insulin resistance issues, giving your body a break from food is probably one of the best things you can do. You know, the old school thinking that to eat six meals a day is beneficial for you. I cannot disagree with that more. And the reason being is when your pancreas is getting that insulin surge every couple of hours because you are eating every couple of hours, the, the poor liver and the pancreas never get a chance to rest. So when it comes to even, you know, just having an overnight 12 hour fast, that alone can be very challenging for people. So often I'll tell people not to snack at night. And it's like I have two heads. People look at me like I'm a crazy person. But if you just start with something so simple like 12 hours, then work your way up and figure out for you what actually works for you, that's how I'd want somebody to actually utilize intermittent fasting. And again, this, the other part of this is too is that you don't need to do it every uh, seven days a week. You pick one or two days a week that you're going to commit yourself to doing a fast whether that be a 16-hour fast or a 20-hour fast, what, what have you, whatever works for you, that alone will benefit you substantially. Hopefully that makes sense. And if there's any questions, feel free to put them in. Now, the next thing, of course, is you know having proper amount of healthy fats and proper amount of protein that's going to stabilize insulin levels. It's not just about having protein and vegetables or what have you. We want to ensure that if you are going to take a nutrient or a supplement, that we're going to ensure that we are going to be balancing our own nutrient intake. But I think I need to touch on alcohol, though. Alcohol is one of the biggest issues, I believe, in our society. And the reason for that is if you look at a glass of beer or a glass of wine, or whatever the case is, it is pure sugar. But unfortunately, in our society, this is very, very common thing. You know, what do you do Friday night? You go for a drink with your girlfriends or the buddies or whatever the case is. You know, you know, you play basketball once a week and everyone goes for drinks or you play volleyball, whatever the case is. There is absolutely no benefit to alcohol. And yes, there's lots of research out of Europe, but you have to look at the European lifestyle is extremely different and their farming practices is completely different than ours. So that means that how our body will utilize alcohol, I'm going to explain this right now. So when your body takes in alcohol, now let's say you're going to have more than a half a glass of wine or you're going to have more than half a pint of beer, the first place that alcohol actually targets is your frontal lobe. That's the area where you're supposed to be a pretty smart person. That's the area now that we're at one, by the time alcohol gets to it, you become just a little dumber. Not completely, but just a little bit, okay? Then you keep on drinking. Now, the next next place that alcohol will target is actually the amygdala. That is our fear center in the brain. The more you drink, the less scared you end up getting. I'm sure we all have stories about stupid things that we've done in those type of circumstances, but this is where you see, you know, the younger people or older, whoever in this case may be, jumping off of, you know, balconies and not being any, no fear whatsoever. The more you keep on drinking, though, the last place it'll actually get to is the hippocampus, and that is our memory. This is where blackouts happen. I have had a number of patients over the last 15-year practice tell me that they have actually blacked out, but completely functional blackouts, meaning that they booked a ticket, you know, went on an airplane, have zero recollection going on a trip and coming back. 
Now, that's obviously the harsh things I'm telling you, but at the end of the day, when it comes to nutrient depletion, this is one of the best ways you can do it. You can take the multivitamins and B-complex until you're blue in the face, but if you're drinking alcohol, all you're doing is literally flushing this out of the kidneys. So I'm not saying don't ever drink again. That's obviously not the goal. Yes, you know, there's parties, there's birthdays and what have you. There is nothing wrong with having a beverage on a special occasion, but on a regular consumption basis, on a weekly or daily basis, something you really need to think about, especially when you're looking at your own nutrients. One of the biggest deficiencies I find here in North America is magnesium. Magnesium is used in over four to 500 functions in the body. So if you think about just, you know, the amount of, you know, the metabolism that happens in our body, your heart, remember, is the most metabolically active organ that we have, which means that the most number of ATP is there. That's how our body's going to make the energy. Your femur, uh, sorry, your uh, quads are the second largest, right, over your heart. So magnesium requirements for the heart to function correctly and, you know, having that electrical conductivity to its best, magnesium is probably one of the most critical thing. And, and let's be honest, like stress cannot, we cannot get away from stress whatsoever. And in our society with the level of stress that we have, one of the, the easiest and cheapest ways versus, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. If you're severe depression and you have severe anxiety, of course, sometimes we need to have some type of pharmaceutical to help us get through. But when it comes to, you know, little stresses daily, whether it be somebody cutting off, like today there's this protest again, two days in a row and I'm stuck in traffic. Magnesium is a lovely, lovely thing to uh, just incorporate. Now, there's different forms of magnesium. Not all the forms are created equal. Magnesium bisglycinate is amazing for athletes because it will not touch the bowels, but it will support the mitochondria as well as it supports the heart. The other form, which is magnesium citrumate, I will often recommend if somebody, let's say, is prone to constipation and stress sometimes will either bring on constipation or they're very, very sensitive to external forces. Magnesium citramate is another, is a great form. That one is, uh, however, best taken in the evening. Whereas magnesium bisglycine, because it doesn't touch the bowels and it doesn't make you sleepy, you can actually do it during the daytime, so in the morning, in the afternoon, you know, whatever really works for you. Now, the next thing we're going to touch on is good old vitamin C. So vitamin C is probably, you know, a very, very popular supplement, but sometimes I don't think we realize what actually C is for. Often people think, oh, my immune system is down, I need to take vitamin C. But when you think of vitamin C, think of actual collagen itself. Collagen has become this very popular supplement as well. Now, you know, collagen absorption is something that's very, very tricky. You will have the you know fish people tell you that their collagen is the best because it's with fish scales. You'll have the beef people tell you that the beef collagen is the best thing. At the end of the day, though, when you become collagen deficient, you need to look at what your vitamin C is. Vitamin C storage is very little because remember, vitamin C is a water soluble substance. And if you're someone that's very active, you know, you run or you're spinning or you're doing yoga, whatever the case is, after any type of activity, one of the best things you can do for yourself is ensure that you're getting adequate amounts of vitamin C. Now, how much vitamin C is always questionable because vitamin C will touch the bowels. So one of the things is, you know, you know, generally you can do anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams of vitamin C. But for some people, that doesn't touch the bowels, so that's great. That means you won't get any diarrhea. If you can do more, great. But the biggest take home I want you to have is vitamin C is not just for the immune system. Vitamin C really is for tissue repair. It's for collagen repair, collagen synthesis. That means in your bones and your tendons and your muscles. So when you're doing really hard workouts, your need for vitamin C is going to skyrocket. So ensuring that you get enough and being that it's water soluble, any excess, you're not going to have you know, a buildup in the body, you're going to get it excreted through the kidneys. Okay. Now, let's talk about the pre, post, and, you know, some diuretic stuff and, and what have you. I get lots of us, uh, lots of these types of questions as well. There's obviously not one size fits all. And, you know, when, you're, when I'm working with bodybuilders and, and what have you, I cannot tell you the difference between every single person. It is not, not all about chicken and tilapia and good old green beans. 
the the thing is you've got to know your own genetics like one of the things i do do that andre had mentioned is something called the apoe genetic testing so apoe we get one from mom one from dad so like and like all of our genes is always two copies so depending on which gene you actually have would determine how much fat is actually beneficial for this person how much you know protein is actually beneficial for this person so something just to look at though is when you're trying to build muscle or you're trying to ensure that you are having um you're not as sore the next day and you just for for recovery itself one of the easiest thing you can do is add a branch chain amino acid during your exercise that is the best way that you can to ensure that your body's actually repairing now you know before you have a workout so this is like several hours before it does not have to be immediately before your workout look at some type of you know plant-based protein uh shake or so with some type of medium glycemic fruits and fats so something like bananas are for pre are great uh and you know throwing in an avocado in a shake if you can handle that throwing in some greens in there so that you're going to get the energy that you need and the fat that you need to get through that intense workout and when it comes to post uh, workouts, one of the best things to do is not shakes. I know there's a big, you know, hoopla out there, like you have to do this shake post post workout. It doesn't have to be that way. Post, if you can actually actually eat real food, and you know the whole thing with you have to eat within 20 minutes, that's not that's not actually true. If you eat within about two hours, you still have plenty of time where your body's going to be able to recover. Now, so, so BCAAs, again, I'm going to just touch on this for a second. In order to actually build and gain mass, that's one of the easiest ways to actually have it during your physical workout itself. Now, diuretics, I'm just going to say it, just don't use them. It's just there is, you know, the load and the intensity that it you know affects your heart is absolutely huge. There's just no need for it. There are a few safer alternatives, of course, which I can tell you about. Coffee being one of the easiest diuretics that one can use. Hibiscus tea is great. Green tea, black tea is also, you know, wonderful. Dandelion root is another one that's probably one of the safest, safest ways you can have a diuretic without it actually harming your kidneys themselves. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense there. Now, and this whole thing with you know, refueling. So these are the, some of the mi mixed conceptions here. So contrary to popular belief, you can eat as long as a one and a half hours post a workout. You don't need to worry about that whole 20 minute uh, window thing. And six to seven meals per day, like I was saying, really, really wreaks havoc on the pancreatic secretion of insulin. So recovery will definitely take a lot longer for you because then your body will then think it's under stress with extra insulin. You really need to be mindful of that. So when it comes to protein requirements now, so this is often a very popular question. What you want to look at is about two and a half to three grams of protein per kilogram of body weight each day. Now that will be too much for the kidneys. This is why I have often seen kidney functions plummet post shows. And there's something called urine albumin creatinine ratio. What that, what that indicates is um, that there's actually leakage in the, in the kidney. So albumin is this large molecule that filters out what needs to go out and keeps in what needs to stay in. If you have too much protein, what's gonna happen is that ACR, that albumin creatinine ratio is gonna go sky high. And that means the kidneys are no longer able to filter for you. So typically for a mass gain, what I recommend is about four to five grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of body weight per day. So for example, so carbs are something that's also very important uh, based on what your genetics are. But this is just general, of course. Four to five grams of carbs per kilogram body weight. So for example, if you're 80 kilogram person and you have an average body fat about, let's say 15 to 20%, then what you would do is you go 80, which is your 80 kilograms, times that by the four to five grams of protein, oh, sorry, by the grams of carbs that you need. And that gives you roughly 320 to 400 grams of good quality carbs or carbohydrates per day, which if you really think about it, is actually quite amount of food. But if you're training to strip fat and build lean muscle mass, then you wanna look at about one to two grams of carbs per kilogram of body, uh, body weight. So one gram for, of course, for strict dieting, and for faster fat loss, but two grams for more moderate and a sustained loss. 
So that means for the same 80 kilogram person, that means around 80 to 160 grams of carbs per day. And then when, when, you know, when we do the meal plan and what have you, it really just depends on the person that's in front of me and what their, um, what their body composition and all of that fun stuff is. So like carbs, there are some fats that are needed regularly, regularly by our body, and you do need to attain, obtain them from our, from your actual diet itself. So things, so foods like that you want to not be scared of are things like avocados and nuts and seeds, and a few vegetable oils that I don't mind are the olive oil or the flaxseed oil. Some animal fats like fish oils also contain high levels of essential fats, such as the omega-3. But these are ones that you do want to consume on a moderate basis and really just depends on, you know, uh, where you are in your exercise years, what have you. And there are a range of fats that should be limited or really avoided if your goal is to build a great body and maintain good health. So saturated fats, which are the types of fat you find in most animal meat, you want to limit them whenever you possibly can. This means the, uh, choosing things like leaner cuts of meat or you know, chicken or trimming the visible fats where it's possible, removing the skin, for instance. And when you are cooking with, with animal fat, again, you know, like oh, everybody's doing this paleo or ketogenic or what have you, you don't necessarily want to be using the bacon fat all the time. You want to look at, you know, just even using something simple like a broth is not a bad thing. The hidden fats are actually everywhere. Using, you know, coconut oil is not as, you know, a great idea or olive oil if you'd like to use. But again, with these types of fats, you never really want to go too high in the heat, right? You want to kind of limit that and maintain that a little bit. Now, you know, all this talk about, you know, what to actually do, but what, what happens when we start to overtrain a little bit? When we overtrain, and I have seen this in men and women, I know my picture here is of a woman, but I've seen this in men and women where the kidney function is not what it, what it actually used to be. That, you know, not giving our body the hormones and it's time to adjust to, exercise, to after exercise will cause massive amounts of injuries in our organs themselves. The mood issues that can occur and the negative changes in our own metabolism and the burnout that can happen within a few months that I have seen. But, you know, not only that, the biggest issue is actually the hormone imbalance that can happen. And not as, and someone's diet could be amazing and they're resting a lot or, or they're sleeping or if you're over-exercising, however, that can actually change. And changes in your heart rate can occur, you know, inability to actually sleep correctly can occur. But again, this is just, you know, I'm not going to touch on them too much, but this is just something to be aware of for sure. You know, just, just be mindful of that. Okay, so now I want to get into some of the supplements here. So one of the things that's really important, especially as an active person, is coenzyme Q10. So CoQ10, remember, for our energy-producing mitochondria, this is the ignition switch. So this is kind of like what turns that key on, the key open, and your now door is going to open. That means the cell is going to actually open up. And coenzyme Q10 really improves the energy of that mitochondria, and your immune system is by far stronger. And CoQ10 is also a major, major antioxidant that really squashes free radicals. So CoQ10, not only fun, it's a fundamental energy transfer molecule that's especially high in organs that demand energy. So those organs, like especially when you're exercising, you may just common sense think about this as your heart, your kidneys, and your liver. And that's because CoQ10 serves as a cofactor, remember, to help synthesize ATP. And remember earlier I was saying that the majority of the ATP is in the heart. That's our most metabolically active organ. So that's one of the reasons why you'll often see CoQ10 in people with heart conditions or on a statin or what have you, but that's not just for them. So if you're an avid athlete and you exercise a lot, this is something that I think is really important to also add into your regimen is to actually add this in. So anywhere from 100 to 200 milligrams is great of CoQ10. The only issue with CoQ10 though is that it is a fat soluble molecule that means that if you're going to take coq10 you actually have to take it with a fat so you can't just take it with water first thing in the morning no that's not going to work because honestly you're going to have expensive poo because coq10 is not cheap you're going to poop it out no need for that what you want to look at is either a spoon of avocado or if you're having some fat in your food for that meal, whether it be lunch, whether it be dinner, the timing of this actually doesn't matter as long as you're 
taking it with some type of a fat. That's CoQ10. Now, the next one is my, one of my personal favorites, nicotinamide riboside. If you have not heard of nicotinamide riboside, you will today. So as a supplement, this is a direct precursor for NAD. Now, NAD is what plays a big, big role when it comes to the ATP production. So yes, you need your coenzyme Q10, because that's your ignition switch, but this nicotinamide riboside is what's gonna help the rest of the electron transport chain actually create the energy that we need. So what happens here is you were talking about supporting your mitochondria. So what ends up happening is when you when you look at different studies that have been you know out there when it comes to nicotinic riboside, this sucker really gives you a lot of energy. I've seen big, big changes when we've added this into like people either that are not repairing properly or let's say they're just fatigued and they're just plain old tired. Adding nicotinic riboside really helps support not only for people that are active, but even people that are possibly not as active really help gain some type of strength back and motivation and drive. That's the other part of it that, you know, all these things actually affect the brain as well. So in, you know, the older population where you're looking at dementia or you're looking at, you know, Alzheimer's or something that is possibly reducing that glucose in the actual brain itself. When you're reducing that glucose in the brain, no matter what age you are, what's going to happen is that energy is going to be going down, not only in the brain, but in the rest of the body. So what you want to look at mostly is how do I add this in? So this nutrient is actually key in having earlier in the day. If you take this later on in the day, you will not sleep. I personally have made that mistake before and I was up majority of the night, which was super annoying. So you're going to take nicotine or riboside, make sure that you take it earlier in the day. So I usually don't recommend this past lunchtime, past lunchtime being, you know, two o'clock. If you're going to eat lunch a little bit later, do not, I uh, wouldn't suggest this past 2 p.m. at all. But first thing in the morning is, you know, usually pretty good. And then again in the afternoon. But for some people, you don't need it twice a day. For some people, once a day really, really does that, that trick. Now, next one, good old bee complex. So we, we talk about, you know, bees all the time, and I'm sure bees are anywhere, but everywhere, but the B vitamins themselves include, you know, your thiamine, which is B1, riboflavin, which is absolutely critical when it comes to your bone marrow and your immune cell production, uh, niacin, which is B3, pantothenic acid, which is B5, pyridoxine, B6, the B12, your biotin and folate that we had talked about earlier. Every single one of them play a role in energy production. None of the B vitamins work separately. They all work synergistically together, which means when you have one B vitamin, you need the other B vitamins to actually work effectively. So this is a very tiny list of what, where Bs are you know, found and where they're you know, important in our, in our body. One study actually I was just reading recently found that deficiency in, in B6 can actually lead to massive amount of oxidative stress uh, after your workout. So if you're actually deficient in B vitamins, then what ends up happening is you're not going to be able to have your peak physical performance or let alone the brain function. Now, if you're eating an optimal diet, supplementing with an extra B will really help support the energy levels themselves. Now, remember, B vitamins are water soluble, which means that any excess, you, your body will essentially use what it needs and then simply uh, excrete the rest. So you don't have to worry about getting too much of a B vitamin. If you've ever noticed your urine going super, super yellow, that is actually because of the riboflavin, the B2. It's the only colored vitamin. B12 often is pink because of the extraction process, not because it's naturally pink. But just something to keep in mind. Now, carnitine. This is my other awesome favorite little fat loss, you know, metabolism booster sucker. So remember we, earlier I was talking about CoQ10. That was your ignition switch. Now, carnitine is the actual shuttle. This is what's going to take CoQ10 and shuttle it into your mitochondria. So this, uh, this molecule has been well, well researched and studied extensively for energy production. So like I was saying, it shuttles fatty acids into the mitochondria. That will oxidize the fat for energy. So this is how you know people don't want some natural metabolism boosters or fat boosters. This is your little uh, key here. The, the way carnitine does it actually helps remove toxic compounds that occur 
in the mitochondria. So whenever your mitochondria are making ATP, you ultimately is going to, is going to create garbage. That's okay. The carnitine's job is to take the garbage and shuttle it out. So even with you know calorie restriction diets or intermittent fasting, carnitine can be actually taken on its own, which is great. You don't need a fat with it per se. Your body will synthesize L-carnitine from the amino acids lysine and methionine, and a lot of foods, especially animal proteins, do contain carnitine in them. There are certain, uh, you know, like to optimize energy levels, typically I usually recommend with one to two grams in divided doses. And now this one is not something that will, you know, keep you up at night. So you can actually dose this morning and night about, you know, the carnitine usually comes in 500 milligram capsules. So you're taking about two capsules in the morning and two capsules in the evening. And then somewhere in there you throw in a CoQ10, you know you're going to get the best bang because of your mitochondria is going to take that initial switch, the CoQ10, and use the carnitine as your shuttle to help move fat where it needs to go, which is out of our body. Curcumin, I'm sure we've had lots of lots of, you know, you've listened to lots of different benefits of curcumin. Curcumin is a major, major anti-inflammatory. There's no way around it. If you look at different cultures, you know, curcumin has been used in cooking for, you know, centuries and centuries. Uh, Turmeric's active compound actually carries a double chain. And that curcumin is a, a powerful antioxidant, but it's also the anti inflammatory component of it, which makes it ideal for post-workouts. So when you've had a really, really hard workout, one of the, you know, nice ways of making sure that your body's able to recover is, you know, you have your BCAAs already, but also adding in some curcumin at the very end of your workout or, you know, after you finish and you get home from the gym, what have you, this is something that you want to be potentially adding in because the other thing it actually does, it reduces overall physical fatigue because when your body's able to deal with those free radicals that you just created when it comes to that workout that you just had, your body's able to uh, ability to actually get the stuff out of you is that much more effective. Um, you know, you can sprinkle some organic turmeric onto your food, um, but just a warning: curcumin, uh, the turmeric itself tastes pretty disgusting. So I do like to cook with it because I find it's a lot easier to palate. Um, unfortunately, a lot of curcumin supplements are not absorbed very well. So what you want to look for when it comes to curcumin supplement is possibly a liposomal one. So one that's in a bit of a gel cap versus a capsule that will actually increase the bioavailability by about 2000%. So again, not all supplements are created equal. You, the curcumin is one of the ones because it is a fat soluble one, like the CoQ10, it should be taken with a fat. However, you have to look at the label though. Curcumin is sold all over the place and, you know, different doses and what have you. Some stuff is more expensive than the other, but you want to look for the liposomal curcumin, then you know your body's going to be able to absorb it best. Another, one of my other favorite ones is D-ribose. So if you look at D-ribose itself, ribose is a backbone sugar of ATP, which means that what it'll actually do is help your mitochondria make so much quicker energy when you're actually doing a workout. So what it does, it actually protects your heart and oh, it's almost like cheating, but it's not on the water list, so not to worry there. But what D-ribose does, it, it almost decreases the load on your heart when you use it pre-workout. So D-ribose I like to use, you know, during athletic performances, either pre, like right before you're about to go into the gym, you, or you can also use it during for energy. Like if you're someone who had a very long day and you're struggling to go to the gym and you're like, oh God, I don't want to go, but I have to go. You put D-ribose in your water and it's going to give you that oomph. It's going to you know, change your brain. And it's going to give you the energy that you need and also allow you to be less cramping, less pain and less stiffness post-workout. Usually it does come as a powder when you roughly around five grams. Do look for one that has magnesium in it within the powder do you not, you, I don't really like the one that's just straight up D-ribose because remember absorption sometimes is an issue. So if you have D-ribose, make sure it has a little bit of magnesium in it in that powder and, uh, and that alone will, will really help change the way your workouts end up being. So it's a little, it can get a little bit, a little bit confusing because the BCAA is in there as well. You can mix them depending on what the workout is entailing. But if you are someone that's struggling with energy and just needs a little bit of extra oomph, that's when you put the D-ribose into the water during the workout and save the BCAs for the very end, uh, like after you get home kind of thing. Okay.
good old lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid is a, a very, 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 very well studied nutrient. It is a cofactor for mitochondrial energy metabolism. This is your workhouse supplement right there. If there is, you know, a day that you can't take any supplements and you don't feel like it, you just take alpha lipoic acid. That alone, powerful antioxidant, will help manage inflammation in the body, your detoxification. But the other uh, benefit to alpha lipoic acid is actually it stabilizes glucose metabolism. So if you're someone that's borderline, uh, you know, diabetic or you have some type of blood sugar issue going on, alpha lipoic acid actually helps to recycle other antioxidants such as glutathione. So what research have found over the over you know just to be having this nutrient studied so extensively with a variety of diseases like the metabolic syndrome, which means the, the blood sugar issue, the neuro neurodegenerative diseases as well, your body will really help benefit by combating that blood sugar instability. So usually with alpha lipoic acid, I recommend roughly 100 milligrams two times a day, but if you're borderline diabetic or are diabetic, this would be more frequent. So it'd be more like 100 milligrams three to four times a day, depending on the person. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Good old BCAs. I think I've touched about this enough. I don't think I have to say too much more, but mainly the take home for this is increasing muscle mass and major, major recovery. Okay. So this BCAs consider making about 35% of our essential amino acids in muscle protein. So when it comes to muscle exercise related muscle damage and post exercise fatigue, there's nothing that beats BCAAs in that regard. The resistance to fatigue alone, for especially glycogen depleted people, uh, I see that a lot in ketogenic diets that are using fat for fuel. This is a powder that really, really has unbelievable beneficial amounts, um, benefic benefits to these uh, individuals themselves. Now, I will warn you, some people really, really hate the taste and they really do not like it. So just make sure you read your labels carefully and you do not want any type of arti artificial sweetener in BCAAs. It needs to be naturally sweetened in order to absorb it. There's no sense in taking BCAAs that has, you know, some type of yucky, like what do you call it? any type of uh, aspartame or any of that garbage in it, you're not gonna benefit yourself at all. So that's one of the drawbacks with BCAAs is just watch your labels. And the last one I'll talk about is N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine, you can think of like the rotor rooter, good old rotor rooter for the actual liver itself. Now, when you look up NAC, often you see it for Tylenol poisoning, which is yes, true, but obviously this is not the reason. NAC is your sulfur component, the cysteine, that's what the C stands for, is the actual cysteine itself. And this is something that really provides protection to the mitochondria. When you're exercising a substantial amount, or you're you know, doing a bodybuilding competition, or you're an MMA fighter, whatever the case is, one of the, the most protective things you can do possibly is to take an N-acetylcysteine supplement daily. And that is um, one, of, one of the most important roles that NAC has. It's a precursor to our major, major antioxidant glutathione. So all of these uh, benefits make NAC probably one of the most easiest things that you can do to optimize your mitochondrial function and optimize energy levels to really get that garbage out of your body as quickly as possible. And that is it. Thank you very much. Is there questions? Andre, should I go to questions? Um, I, that's great. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanwal. This has been absolutely amazing to listen to all the wealth of information that you have been providing. I do have questions that um, we've been monitoring throughout the uh, w webinar. Um, let's start off with um, if people are on a budget, um, what would you say are the essential supplements um, for active people? If you're on a budget and you're an active person, I would say the BCAAs the, and the D-ribose. I just two. Good old simple. I mean, if you're someone that exercises substantially and you're super active, and you know, and these things can absolutely get very costly. D-ribose with the magnesium in it, your BCAAs, and then before you go to bed at night, a magnesium. I just threw a third one in there, and that would be it. Perfect. Now today. you mentioned, okay, so you mentioned magnesium and you went through quite a few different types of magnesium. Um, could you quickly um, 
remind us uh, the different types and the purposes of each type of magnesium. Absolutely. So there's many different forms of magnesium. The most common one that you often see on the shelves is a magnesium citrate or a magnesium citramate, which means citrate and malate. That magnesium is amazing at calming the central nervous system. So if you're having anxiety or you're having any type of you know, depression symptoms, that type of magnesium is wonderful along with constipation. That is best taken in the evening. But if you're an athletic person that needs it more for muscle repair, muscle recovery, to ensure that the muscles themselves have what they need for repairing, magnesium bisglycinate is one of the is is the best form to take. And that can be taken morning or afternoon. The last one that I don't remember if I mentioned or not is something called magnesium threonate. Now that is for people that have some type of heart issues as well. So if you have some type of arrhythmia or if you have high blood pressure or you on, you know, um, either nitroglycerin, if you have an angina, any of those things, magnesium threonate is what is very, very protective for the actual heart itself. And that one again, <laughs> like this glycine, it can be taken any time of the day. It does not cause sleepiness like the citramate does. Thanks, Seema. Um, Dr. Canwell, um, you mentioned the last one for heart issues. Could you spell the magnesium theonate? Can you spell yes. the last part of it? Yes. So magnesium threonate is T-H-R-E-O-N-A-T-E. -E. That's the threonate form of magnesium. What about magnesium oxide? Magnesium oxide is a very, very large macro molecule. And that can be very, very tough to actually absorb itself. That's one of the cheapest magnesiums on the market. And the problem with that is going to be absorption. Now, magnesium is something that's very difficult to get a high quantity in a capsule. But oftentimes you'll see the capsules with oxides are a lot higher, like 500 or 1,000. That's virtually impossible. When you look at magnesium at itself as just a chemical molecule, you cannot get 500 milligrams in one capsule, but oxide is a very, very cheap, very cheap form of magnesium to get. And I find oftentimes that, that is the same supplement that's in sometimes osteoporosis medications, which does not do anything for the bones themselves. So oxide is super cheap. Don't bother. You're going to poop it out. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so what's the benefit of taking actual collagen versus vitamin C? The absorption. It is way easier for your body to actually absorb the vitamin C and allow your body to utilize it to make the collagen. Now, there are plenty of good collagen on the market, absolutely, that would really benefit your joints and your bones and your hair and your skin and all of that. But to get it through, like, let's say bone broth is something that's a lot easier and easier to handle to your body and you can actually absorb it. But the collagen supplements out there not all of them are created equal. That's the only issue. You have to look at the label carefully. You have to look at, is it you know from an organic source? Is it non-genetically modified source of collagen? The issue really is the quality of it. And then of course that's gonna hinder absorption. Great. What's the difference between vegan branch-chained amino acids and regular branch-chained amino acids? Is one better than the other? BCAAs, branch-chained amino acids? Yeah. There, there is yeah. one. They're all vegan. There's no such thing okay. as non-vegan BCAAs. You might be Perfect. thinking protein. Yeah, that's that could be. Um, what about coffee post-workout? It's a wonderful thing. There's no issue with it as long as you make sure you do eat within a roughly two hours. Good. Now, obviously, dehydration is the biggest issue. If you have been hydrated enough and you know you're going to eventually go eat, you know, within your two-hour time frame window, not the 20-minute window garbage, but within the two hours and you'd like to have a little bit of coffee, it's not a problem. Just make sure then in that case, you're actually adding some fat in the coffee. So I'm sure we've heard of her, all have heard of Bulletproof Coffee. But one of, one of my favorite things is post-workout you could do is actually adding a little bit of brain octane into your coffee. So well, like a teaspoon of it is all you need, not the full tablespoon, just a teaspoon post-workout will give you the fat in the coffee that will really help you, you know, be able to wait until later. Okay, great. What are the best carbs to eat when prepping for a bodybuilding show? 
best carbs or, would be your complex. Yeah. yeah, your complex carb. No grains. Absolutely no grains. Okay. They're way, way too high in the carby. So you've got to be careful with the actual uh, root vegetables, like underground. Those can be a bit too high for certain. Again, it really depends on APUEG. There are some bodybuilders have had, you know, with with number twos, I'm just going to call it those two, three, and four, with the twos that really benefit from, like, the really starchier ones, the starchy carbs, whereas some patients, I mean, there are threes or fours, they don't benefit. They would, the maximum carb that they would allow would be an apple, which is, you know, in the mm. sense of it, it's not very carby versus a potato, but for that person, it might be enough of a carb for them to go on. Okay, so you were mentioning about protein intake for fat loss and protein intake for muscle building. Could you go over those uh, numbers per gram per kilogram again for fat loss and muscle building? Absolutely. So when it comes to uh, building uh, protein for, uh, sorry, for, for losing the uh, for fat loss, essentially, you want to stick to anywhere from about one to two grams per kilogram of body weight. Whereas for muscle gain, you want to look at about two and a half to three grams of protein of per kilogram of body weight. So okay, it's a little I've bit heard. different because of the kidney okay. function, right? So that's the only issue is the kidney. It's really, those are just general numbers. With anybody, I always make sure the kidney function is running well first, because if that is not, then these numbers are no longer valid. So it really depends on the person's kidney function. Okay. Now there's a supplement Q. Uh, coenzyme Q10 supplement called Quinol on, Quinol, on the yep. market. Quinol. Mm -hmm. And it says that it's the best out there because it's uh, better absorbed than other Q10s. What, what would you say to that? That's all marketing hoopla. It's marketing bullshit. Okay, so there's no difference then? No, no, there is not. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Good. Um, can you take a co a Q10 with fish oil? Yes, you can because it's a fat. Absolutely. Perfect. And when's the best time to take a B complex? Either earlier in the day. So either morning or at lunch, provided that lunch is before 2 p.m. Because B complex can be very stimulating for some people. Some people take the Bs and they cannot sleep at night. So best, best taken Bs is earlier in the day. All right. How does D-ribose help your heart? D-ribose is a backbone sugar of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So remember I was saying that the heart is the most metabolically active organ we have, which means that it has to make ATP all the time every day. So what D-ribose does when you take it right before your workout or during the workout, it decreases the load in which the heart has to make that ATP. So it's almost like cheating, but it's not cheating. But it is cheating. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So what it'll do is just help the body make that ATP away quicker without you having to actually work for it as hard. You'll find if you're doing a cardio day or whatever, you'll be able to actually go longer. That's amazing. Um, another question uh, that has been posed is where can we find more webinars by Dr. Canwall? I can answer that one. Oh. Um, if you go to the InfoFit .ca website and you go to courses and resources, you will find there that we offer continuing education uh, credit uh, webinars and podcasts. So uh, feel free to browse uh, through the different ones that we offer. Um, and you can also use the search, um, search, search bar to find a particular topic that you're looking for. But Dr. Canwell has been uh, doing webinars and lectures for us for years. So there's a plethora of uh, amazing webinars to go, f go through. Any other questions? Can you explain, all right, let's see. Can you explain the fad, what? Oh, can, can you explain the fad behind MCT oils? That's all from the ketogenic and like, you know, the paleo type of uh, dieting that's been out there because the amount of fat for a ketogenic diet that you're required. So medium chain triglyceride is essentially glorified coconut oil, but MCT oil is stable at room temperature as a liquid. So if you look at coconut oil on its own in nature, it is actually solid. 
but MCT oil itself, um, they have changed, they have processed it a little bit so that you can have that carbon C8 chain now that's going to be readily absorbed, which is essentially supposed to be easier absorbed for the body. And a lot of people have been using it for centuries for energy, but now it's become a popular thing because of intermittent fasting. So if you're intermittent fasting and you're skipping breakfast and you're having lunch only, let's say, what MCT oil actually will help you do if you throw it in your coffee or tea, whatever beverage you drink in the morning, will help you stay uh, fuller longer without feeling hungry. So that's the biggest fad with it is the fact that if you or intermittent fasting, you add a little bit of FCT oil into your coffee, you will not actually get hungry until lunchtime. So the, the, there are some people that really, really benefit from this. And this is where people are having some type of brain fog, or you can't remember things properly, or just your brain is just tired. You know, people that are studying all the time, or you're, you're reading tons of documents or reading papers all the time. Those people will really benefit from the MCT oil and then avid athletes. Great. Um, what about um, MCT oils and coconut oil in terms of people with heart disease or high cholesterol? Would you recommend they take that? It really depends on what the lipoprotein A is. So cholesterol testing is one thing that is very, very incomplete in our in North America here. So when somebody has high cholesterol, that means their LDL is high or the total cholesterol is high, HDL is not high enough. What I then do is further testing. If lipoprotein A, which is a protein that's attached to that LDL particle, if LPA is high, you're not a candidate for coconut oil. If LPA is low, you're completely fine to have coconut oil and it will not touch your cholesterol. Perfect. What is um, a good kidney function number? Well, there's BUN, which is blood urea nitrogen. There is uh, creatinine, there's GFR, and there's urine ACR. Ideally, you want urine ACR, which is albumin creatinine ratio, to be less than one, or essentially zero. That's primary health. GFR, which is glomerular filtration rate, you want around 100. Creatinine, you want anywhere from 50 to 70. Great. What are your thoughts on taking ashwagandha? Ashwagandha is a great adrenal support, but some people don't do well with it. It really makes them buzzy. So you have to figure that out for yourself. <laughs> but I love ashwagandha. I personally take it daily because I have, you know, so many children in the house, so I need it. But it's an awesome adrenal stabilizer, which means that it'll help your body make the right amount of cortisol that you actually need and not overproduce. Okay, and we'll take one more question. Does anybody have one more question for us? While we're waiting for that question, if any questions, um, Dr. Canwell, I want to thank you very much for this insightful uh, webinar. And um, we're going to put this on our site as well, so you can access it. If you're looking for continuing education credits, then there is going to be a $10 um, fee for that so that we can send you the continuing education credit certificate. I don't see any more. Oh, is creatine good? I suspect a creatine monohydrate. Yeah, the creatine, you have to look at kidney function again. Creatine, you know, can cause a lot of uh, swelling in the kidneys itself that I have seen. It is one of the ones that is, you know, very, very up and down with different people, depending on if you're bodybuilding or you an MMA fighter, like what it is that your goals are that would determine if creatine is actually, you know, beneficial for a person or not. Um, I, it really is individualized creatine. It's not one size fits all for that one at all because I've seen it do awful things to kidneys. Okay, but wouldn't that be in large amounts only? Uh, no, it's actually, I've seen it in small amounts as well. You know, oh. depending on what your APOE gene is, you have to be very mindful of creatine. Okay, what about magnesium malate? Magnesium malate is great for the muscles and for joints as well. So oftentimes you'll find magnesium 3 and 8, you'll find malate and bisglycine all in one capsule. That's a great little one to take that will not cause any type of sleepiness. Okay, perfect. Well, I think we've come to the uh, end of our uh, webinar and we're just uh, four minutes over. And I want to thank every one of you for joining us here. And once again, if you are interested in listening to this webinar again, we have it available to you. Um, if you want CCs, please. Um, 
contact our office and we will um, send you the certificate once you listen to it. In order to get the certificate, you will need to tell us the 10 uh, best things you've learned from listening to the webinar. Send that to us in an email and then we will send you the continuing education credit certificate. Dr. Canwell, you are absolutely brilliant and amazing. No, <laughs> I want to thank you very much. Very in-depth and informative uh, webinar. And um, I wish you and everyone else the, uh, the best this evening and for the rest of the week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.